We're in the midst of a series of discussions about premillennialism. Premillennialism, of course, is the theory that just prior to an imagined millennium age, Jesus will return to the earth. Hence, premillennialism. The idea of the millennium comes from the concept of a thousand years. Found only once in Scripture, actually, in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. In subsequent studies, we'll look at that in depth. The Lord willing, attempt to give an adequate interpretation of the passage and show what it means as opposed to what it does not. We'll look at some other texts also, such as Matthew chapter 24, a favorite among premillennialists. But as we discussed last week, we could specifically say the viewpoint that we are investigating could be called uh, millenarian dispensationalism or dispensation, dispensationalist millenarianism. There are various ways of putting it because it's a combination of views that developed back several decades ago, in fact, in the early part of the 19th century. As we mentioned, Darby, the Schofield Bible, and others who have had tremendous influence in spreading abroad the ideas of dispensationalism. We're not going to a, a further discussion of that, but simply to remind ourselves that this is the influence behind the premillennial theory. Although the idea of accepting a literal thousand-year reign of Christ from the earth has been around much longer, it just has not been combined with this particular viewpoint for that long in church history. This time we're looking at part two, though technically it's really part three since we divided up part one into two lessons last Lord's Day. But this time we have thought through the matter and we have gone ahead and made the proper divisions knowing just how much time will actually be involved. Is the soon coming rapture right around the corner, as so many are speaking of? We're living in a period of time where the doomsday mentality prevails and so many people are expected that something is about to happen. The influences are everywhere. Even here among ourselves, occasionally, I say among churches of Christ, not necessarily in this congregation, some good meaning brother will choose this song that's in our hymn books. Jesus is coming soon. And we'll begin all of us to sing together. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we hold so dear, now is at stake. And then, of course, the idea taken from some biblical language, but I believe taken out of context. Love of so many cold, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. And then the next stanza goes on to make this startling statement. When these signs come to pass, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast. Trumpets will sound. And then, of course, the chorus continues. The point is, in the second stanza, the songwriter Mr. R. E. Winsett indicates that we can look at the signs of the times and we can infer that Jesus is coming, not just any time, but he's coming soon. We have this sometimes, this phraseology in other hymns. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry skies. It could be. We do not know, as we shall see. We do not know. No one knows. We cannot overemphasize the importance of this point. No one knows but the Lord God himself when that time will be. And yet the influence is everywhere. As I pointed out last week, we have books by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. And not just books, but films that have been made based upon these books. The Left Behind series, at least 12 in this particular series. This man has made a huge name for himself, Tim LaHaye, Dr. LaHaye in talking about this, but I want to point out that while there's some interesting things in these books, these books are wrong. These films are wrong. They say things that are not true. They teach things that are not right. We need to understand that and beware of that as we look at them. Again, Mr. LaHaye is a great scholar. Looks familiar. He's a great scholar. And some of the things he says are interesting, but he's wrong on these fundamental points. He's wrong. Everybody loves a good scare. It was said in the beginning of the book uh, that we mentioned earlier by Hal Lindsey last week, the late great planet Earth. And I think that's part of the reason why there is such a push today for the Left Behind series. And Dr. LaHaye has made a real name for himself in talking about these matters. And it's last time we pointed out much of the problem comes from the fact that Bible prophecies are misinterpreted. There are various, but the three really big ones they go to 
that derive most of their teaching are actually parts of the book of Daniel here and there. Matthew chapter 24, which is a difficult chapter that we plan to spend an entire discussion on later on, the Lord willing, and parts of the book of Revelation, often much of it, but especially chapter 20. We're dealing with a question of prophecy and how it should be interpreted. Broadly, let me make this observation. When a prophecy was written with the intent by its author that it be understood literally, we are obligated as fair interpreters to take it literally. But when a prophecy was written, obviously with the intent for us to understand it figuratively, not literally, we are remiss if we try to understand it literally. The problem is, today, many would want to equate understanding prophecy, all prophecy, literally, with fundamentalist views, with respect for Bible authority. Again, we insist, true respect for Bible authority says, if it was intended to be literal, it must be taken to be literal. Liberalism fails in this regard. It will allegorize or turn into metaphor, passages that were obviously meant to be taken historically and literally. On the other hand, this kind of millenary fundamentalism, dispensationalism, does the opposite, and it takes passages that were meant to be, obviously meant to be understood figuratively from the outset, and will turn them into literal statements that will end up teaching things as we are seeing in this particular study. So what we have before us is a series of errors based on misinterpretation of prophetic texts. We'll review quickly what their point of view is. As we said last time, they argue that when Christ first came to the world, he intended to set up his earthly kingdom, but was delayed in that because he was rejected by the Jews. Earthly kingdom. They also say that as a result of that failure to set up the earthly kingdom the first time around, he set up the church as an afterthought. It was temporary until he comes back to set up that kingdom which will be earthly. Nowadays, from the signs of the times, as we saw in the hymn that we looked at earlier, we can infer that Christ is coming soon, indeed, most likely in the present generation. And when he comes, his second coming will actually consist of two phases. Two phases. First, he will come and secretly rapture the church will suddenly disappear right out of our clothes as they have in the Left Behind series. There will also be a first resurrection, they say, and people will be raised from the dead to meet the Lord in the air. Those who are with the Lord will either go off to heaven or remain with him for seven years in the air, according to this theory. During that seven-year period will come what is called the Great Tribulation. For the first three and a half years, for half of that time, the Jews will be in the process of all returning to their homeland and reestablishing the old Jewish worship as we found under the law of Moses. And the Jewish temple will be rebuilt there at Mount Moriah. And Jewish worship sacrifices will all be reinstituted. And the second half of the seven year period known as the Great Tribulation, conflicts will begin to ensue. Peace treaties will be signed. Peace treaties will be broken. Jews will flee. A remnant will go to Petra, some will say down south of Jerusalem, old Edomite territory. And then finally this conflict will lead to the great battle of Armageddon. We've heard so much about it. There will be forces led by Antichrist from the revived Roman Empire and the false prophet. And they will threaten to destroy the Jews. But right when it looks so bad, the second phase of the second coming. Second phase will take place after the seven years from the first phase. Christ will return all the way to the surface of the earth this time. With his raptured saints, he will come with his saints and he will establish his earthly kingdom there in Jerusalem. He will sit on the literal throne of David in the literal city of Jerusalem and begin a thousand year reign upon earth of peace and prosperity. Satan will have been bound during that thousand years, but near the end of the millennium will be loose for a season for a short time to deceive the nations. And then finally will come the end of everything. Satan will be defeated, cast in the lake of fire. The world will end, judgment will begin, and Christ will deliver the kingdom that he's ruled over for a thousand years literally to the Father. Those are the basic tenets with minor variations here and there, but that's generally what's being taught around us in so many Protestant churches of our time. 
Last time, we focused on the idea of the delayed kingdom. That Christ had come to set up a physical kingdom, but was rejected and had to delay it. And we looked at the assumptions that are made and we disproved them. Because they wrongly assume Christ meant to set up a carnal kingdom, but he said, my kingdom is not of this world. It wrongly assumes that his rejection by men was somehow uh, unforeseen and that that delayed the divine purpose. Yet it was not delayed. Jesus himself said in his prayer just prior to his crucifixion to the Father, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, John 17, 4. It wrongly assumes that the church is only a temporary substitute for the intended physical kingdom, and yet the church was eternally planned, Ephesians 3 and verse 10. And this idea wrongly assumes that the kingdom is not yet established, but will be established in the future. However, Colossians 1.13 says we are now in the kingdom. We've been translated into the kingdom. That major point then was mistaken. This time we look at their idea of the secret rapture. And remember what they're saying. It isn't just that we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, caught up in the clouds as Corey was reading a moment ago. It's that it will all take place on a secret basis and only a few will be privy to it, the ones who are so caught up. Suddenly people will notice vanishing folks all around and there will be a lot of consternation trying to figure out what's going on, but this will take place in secret and it will take place with an interval of a seven years during the Great Tribulation before anything more takes place. Our approach to this point by the premillennialists is respectful but we want to do two things this morning. Look at their proof texts to see if they really establish what they say. We will show that there is, in fact, no biblical support, though they offer things. We will interpret the passages they look at correctly. As time permits, then the Lord willing, this evening we will come back and see that, secondly, their viewpoint actually contradicts what is plainly taught. So the first point is to notice that it's not taught the second is to notice that what they say actually contradicts what is taught. So let's look at the first point. The idea that the rapture will come and there will be this hiatus between the rapture and what they call the glorious appearing of Jesus. Now Jesus won't appear in the rapture. He will not be seen by men according to this theory. But he will be seen seven years later in the glorious appearing. The phraseology of course comes from Titus 2 and verse 13 that speaks of the glorious appearing. But when you look at that passage and when you look at the verse in context, it makes no distinction between the second coming and the day of resurrection and the day that the saints rise to meet the Lord of the areas. Corey read for us a moment ago. No such distinction is made, but they make that distinction. What is the support for the idea of this difference or this distinction? Well, I was curious about this, and thanks to our sister Amber, she gave me a very useful book written by Tim LaHaye. Most of the other things we looked at that I showed a while ago are fictional. In this book, The Merciful God of Prophecy, LaHaye sets forth in plain language what his views are. This is very helpful. No fiction here, no poetry, right out prose. And in this prose, he said, this is the proof, this is the proof, here's what will happen. So we are going to respectfully analyze what Mr. LaHaye, Dr. LaHaye, has had to say in his writings. He says in page 50, 157, that Revelation 19.14 is evidence of this distinction. What does the verse say? Well, I have it decided here. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Wait a minute, you have to have the wrong verse. No. <laughs> That's what he cited. And this is evidence for a secret rapture? Yes. Yes, he argues this. This is evidence for the secret rapture. Wait, wait, let me look at it. Let us look at it again. I don't see rapture. I don't see I don't see people being caught up. I don't see vanishing people. Nothing. But this is one of his proof texts. It provides no text at all. But really, they have more of an inference here than they do actual statements in Scripture. They have concluded from logic that the rapture must occur first and it will be secret, the rapture of the church alone. How is that? Well, they reject that the Christians will end up going through the Great Tribulation. But if the Great Tribulation comes and Jesus has not yet raptured the church, then we will go through the Great Tribulation. Since we cannot go through the Great Tribulation, then the rapture has to happen first. It's a matter of inference. But here the problem is one that they have imagined. 
Because their imagined problem, the saints you know, having to go, undergo the great tribulation if they're not raptured, is a problem of their own devising. Because they have come up with a weird interpretation of the great tribulation. Scripture does not teach their doctrine of the great tribulation in the way that they articulate it. The great tribulation is a phrase that will be found in Matthew chapter 24. And as we shall see, it has application to times just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And must not be misappropriate to refer to some imagined event that has not yet happened. So their conjured up doctrine of what the great tribulation will be for seven years of warfare and ending in the battle of Armageddon is all a problem that they have created. So there's no need for this fictional account of a secret resurrection. LaHaye, however, gives some other evidence, quote, unquote. He looked at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 15 and 54, and uh, he says that it shows the rapture will come, this verse, this set of verses, and it will be secret, and it will be instantaneous. Now, here's what the passage says. Now, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood and not inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality, and so on. Then he goes on to quote some prophetic statements in the Old Testament about the victory through death that we will have. Now this, he says, is proof of the secret rapture. Yes, we will admit it teaches that when the transformation of our bodies finally does occur, it will be instantaneous in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. But the text says nothing, nothing at all about a secret rapture. In fact, notice the very opposite is true from what LaHaye intends. This text says it will happen when the trumpet sounds. You don't sound a trumpet if you mean to hide something or to come in secretively. The trumpet sounds. There will be a shout, as we saw from the reading a while ago in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, and the voice of the archangel. This will occur in an audible, visible way. The dead will be raised, but when that happens, it will all take place in one hour, at one given point in time, John 5, 28 to 29, which we will notice momentarily in detail. There's no textual support for the secret rapture idea and for the divisions of in the so-called phases of the second coming, the rapture and then the great, uh, the glorious appearance. They also look at our passage that Corey read a while ago. And here they think that, in fact, this is where they derive the word rapture, which they will admit is not found in any standard English translations of the Bible. The passage says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven secretly, quietly. People will suddenly start being left behind. No, the passage says he will come from heaven with a shout. The shout of the Lord is not intended to hide something. With the voice of the archangel, can that not be heard? And with the trumpet of God, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so or thus shall we ever be with the Lord. Now here, this particular phrase, caught up, is where they derive their word rapture, which comes from a Latin term. The Greek word is harpazo, and it, many, it literally means this, to grab or to seize, to suddenly remove, or gain control, to snatch, to take away. In fact, they use this terminology, the snatching away, the taking away. We can go with them on that. We can say that it's going to be a snatching away, but it's not secretly vanishing from one's clothes on airplanes or out on the public streets. It will be a snatching away where we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds in a visible, noticeable manner. So we will all go to meet the Lord in the air and all the dead will be raised together, both the good and the bad. This is not a separate event from the end of the world. It will be a visible event. It will be an audible event. There will be shouts. There will be voices of archangels. There will be the trumpet of God. Revelation 1 and verse 7 reiterates this point. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. This is just like what the angels, the men in white apparel, announced to the disciples when they had seen the Lord and 
Luke's account in Acts chapter 1. Ascend back into heaven. He ascended in the clouds. Notice, he ascended in the clouds. And they said, why do you keep gazing into heaven? This same Jesus will so return in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He will come with clouds. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9. And you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, not secretly, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who should be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. How obvious that will be, and it will be for judgment. The judgment is not going to be delayed for a thousand years plus seven at the end of the world. The judgment's going to happen when it returns. There is no distinction in Scripture, especially in passages like this, between the second coming and the day of resurrection, which is also the day the saints will be caught up, snatched up to meet the Lord. In fact, notice Revelation 1-7 says, Those who pierce the Lord will see Him. Where are they now? They're in tombs all around Palestine. Their bones may be there and may still exist. How on earth will they possibly see the Lord? They must be resurrected. Both the good and the bad will be resurrected. As this is occurring, to see the Lord come. Those who pierced Him will see Him. There's no textual support for the secret rapture doctrine and division between the so-called rapture and the glorious appearing. They allege that Christ is going to come in the second phase, the glorious appearing. That happens at the end of the Great Tribulation. And He will come with His saints, the raptured saints. They cite texts that speak of the Lord coming with His holy ones. Ah, that must be evidence of the rapture, that He's coming with the raptured saints. But those references do not refer to raptured saints, but to the mighty angels, as we notice. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, Matthew 25, 31, then will He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Second, this one is 1, 7 and 9. We've noticed Jude 14 and 15 also cites a strange prophecy from Enoch, the seventh from Adam, that said, Behold, he comes with ten thousands of his saints. He's coming with those, those holy ones. Saints means holy ones, and in context, it refers to the mighty angels who will be coming with him to help bring about judgment in the world. But Lahay offers another proof text for the secret rapture. And, and I was scratching my head when I read it in his book on the merciful God of Prophecy. So on page 157, he says it's in Revelation 4, especially verses 1 to 2. Here's what the passage says. After these things I look, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I have heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what may, must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. <laughs> That's it. That's what we've been looking for, LaHaye said. There's the, there's the proof of the secret rapture. There's the proof of the division between the rapture and the glorious appearing seven years later. Really? Well, it goes on to say now, the fourth chapter of Revelation provides us with a picture of the rapture. And they also admit, while I would never base the rapture teaching on this single passage, you think? <laughs> I do think it points a good image, uh, paints a good image of the rapture, a doctrine more fully disclosed in other texts, okay? Well, which are those other texts, and why don't you go to them instead of these obscure, strange texts? They don't, they don't in any way support what you think that they do. Why don't you look at those? This passage has nothing remotely to do with the rapture. The only thing that might even possibly remind us of it, well, is the mention of the trumpet. But that's against the idea of the secret rapture. That's a noticeable rapture. That's a, a catching up, rather, that everybody can hear, that everybody can see. So the rapture idea is just not taught in the Bible. And you can look at all these passages, and none of them in any way indicates what they think needs to be taught. The alleged support of it is just lacking. They take texts out of context, such as the ones we've just looked at. Or they look at certain texts like 1 Thessalonians 4, where they actually get the idea of the snatching away, the rapture. And they ignore the plain wording, which says it will happen with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Just completely, totally ignore that. Yes, congregation, Christ is coming again. And it could be this very hour. 
we do not know. The Lord willing, we'll look more closely at the idea of date setting and whether or not what happened in this generation this evening. We will also look at contradictory teachings between the Bible and premillennialism on the point of the rapture. But the rapture, as they say it, is not taught in the Bible. It could happen sooner or later, a snatching up or being carried off to meet the Lord in glory. But we do not know. Thus, as Jesus said, we should always be prepared for in such an hour as we think not the Son of Man comes. Are you ready for that great event? The Bible definitely teaches the second coming. It definitely teaches the end of the world and judgment. We must be ready. Have you been baptized for the remission of sins? You need to make things right with the Lord as an early child of God. Whatever the need is, let it be known right now while together we stand and say.